If you remember seamlessly going from ground to space combat, attacking the Death Star 2, and playing through a campaign spanning the prequels, original trilogy, and expanded universe, then you played Star Wars Battlefront 3. Oh, wait, no, you didn't, because it never came out. Well, you're in luck because I've got my hands on a leaked developer version of Battlefront 3, and in this video, I'm going to go through it in detail to show you how incredible this game was going to be. Now, this is an unfinished internal build of the game, which means that, in addition to being hilarious, glitchy, some sections found in the design documentations just hadn't been created yet. So I'm going to be using footage from Elite Squadron to try and fill in those gaps. And for those that don't know, Battlefront Elite Squadron was supposed to be the PlayStation 2 and PSP port of Battlefront 3, but it ended up being rebranded after the flagship version of Battlefront 3 got cancelled. Also a shout out to the Free Radical Archive, their wiki and discord have been an invaluable source of information for this video. Okay, let's begin by taking a look at Battlefront 3's campaign mode which was supposed to be one of this game's key features. Just like Elite Squadron, Battlefront 3's campaign follows X1 and X2, a pair of clones secretly created from the DNA of Jedi Master Fallon Gray by the Kaminoans. The story has the player control X2 and starts in the waning days of the Clone Wars with the two brothers stationed above Tatooine. We also get introduced to General Feroda, the Jedi who leads their clone garrison. Whoa, watch the lightsaber mark so you've just smacked X1 right in the power couplings. Like any tutorial, the first level is designed to familiarize the player with the game mechanics. The game is also very keen for you to get into a starfighter and show off the seamless space to ground combat. The final version of the game was supposed to have you land on Tatooine, then snipe some Tuscans before switching to Master Feroda and having him take on a Rancor. This would be a nice piece of foreshadowing for the Jedi sections later on in the game. The first proper level is also set on Tatooine. The clones are having a nice chill day when the droid army suddenly attack, which gets X1 very angry. And this level was really designed to show off Battlefront 3's main gameplay loop. We start on the ground, blasting some droids, then we get into this orbital cannon where you've got to shoot down the dropships. And just look at these terrible droid pilots, I won't even have to shoot them at this rate. X1 then grabs a dropship and we blast off into space where we have to dock into the hangar of this acclimator. You grab one of the Star Destroyers and fly over to the droid control ship where we have to recreate the ending of episode 1 by flying deep inside, blowing up the core and bailing right before it explodes. And I've got to say, as far as first levels go, this is pretty f***. Wizard, even if I did end up falling into the abyss a few times. The Tatooine map is reminiscent of the Moss Eisley map from the original game, only this time it's a bit more spread out to make better use of the new vertical battlefield mechanics. The next level takes place on Coruscant and starts with the two clone brothers being awarded a medal for their valor by the floating robes of Palpatine. Unfortunately, the ceremony is cut short due to a surprise attack by the Separatists. Battlefront 3's Coruscant map is set in the upper city. It's filled with a bunch of walkways, apartments, and even this bar, where for some reason the announcer keeps saying this is Tatooine. This is Tatooine. And even in this early state, the developers did a great job of providing a snapshot into the battle at the start of Episode 3. From all the chaos up in the sky with command ships blowing up, down to the action at ground level where you can see crashed dropships and debris scattered all over the streets. Oh look, it's Master Windu! Well, come on mates, do something. Ah, to be honest, it's about the same as the window from Battlefront 1. And look, it's Yoda. Look at him go like some kind of Coruscant street rat. Is uh, anyone gonna tell him he's forgot to turn his lightsaber on? Okay, so you hijack one of the droid starfighters and then take it up into the skies. Now, Free Radical did this clever trick with the levels. The actual playable section of the ground maps is about the same size as the first two Battlefront games. But they're always surrounded by all of these environments that fool you into thinking the map is absolutely huge. The level ends with X2 landing inside one of the droid capital ships and sabotaging it from the inside, which is quite different from what we ended up getting in the Coruscant level of Elite Squadron where X2 stayed on the ground and fought General Grievous. This is also a good place to know that the interiors of all the command ships are much bigger than they were in Battlefront 2. In addition to areas like the hangar and the reactor core, we also get these sections with the gun turrets and cannons and the escape pods which 
which you can use to go back to the ground map. The next level is Cato Nimordia. We start by doing this flyby in a dropship before landing and storming the city. The clones and General Faroda disable the city's defenses, then move into Newt Gunray's castle where they deactivate the remaining droids. The clones then get a zoom call from Palpatine who issues Order 66. And so the level ends with an epic showdown between X2 and Master Faroda. <laughs> Okay, it was supposed to be a bit more epic in the final game. Look, he's doing Wing Chun and everything. Under the rule of the new empire, X-1 and X-2 make a name for themselves as Vader's Jedi hunters. And X-1 is loving it. Meanwhile, X-2 starts to grow distant. The two brothers are then sent to Dantooine to destroy an entire village full of innocent civilians who are suspected of harboring a Jedi. X-2 goes against orders and decides to help the civilians. Actually, maybe X-1 did have a point. Some of these folks, they seem beyond help. No, don't just all stand in one place, you'll get taken out by the orbital cannon. Dantooine is quite a large map. It mixes open areas like these hills and forests, with more built up sections like these villages and courtyards. It also has a really interesting aesthetic, it kind of feels like Rohan meets Naboo. This map is also supposed to be the setting for a pivotal part of the story. X2 does eventually meet the Jedi hiding on Dantooine who turns out to be Fallon Grey, the man whose DNA the Kaminoans use to create the clone brothers. X2 and Fallon Grey work together to protect the village, but their father-son bonding is cut short when X1 turns up. Angered by his brother's betrayal, he kills X2 and wounds Fallon Grey before taking his lightsaber and shooting off. But the Jedi Master ends up saving X2 by giving him the last of his life force. The story picks up several years later with nothing to fight for, X2 has become a farmer on Dantooine. But one day, General Kota from the Force Unleashed decides to make a cameo. Turns out, Kota was actually Fallon Grey's old master. And now he's looking for help with the fledgling Rebel Alliance, which X2 reluctantly joins. His first mission is to the Desolation Station, a Death Star construction facility located on an asteroid field. And look, you can even see the skeleton of the Death Star in the distance. X2 uses a stolen shuttle to land in the hangar. He and the Rebel forces then fight their way through the facility where the Empire are using slave Wookiees to build the Death Star. X2 frees the Wookiees steals a TIE fighter and lands it on the big floating laser which is about to be installed into the Death Star. The rebels then use the laser to destroy the Desolation Station. Up next is a level in Yavin 4 which takes place right after the Death Star destruction, hence why the sky above is filled with debris. This level has X2 and bounty hunter Shara Vale escape the planet while the Imperial forces seek retribution on the rebellion. This map is based around the Yavin Temple but unlike Battlefront 1, Free Radical really opened up the environment. It kind of reminds me of the Yavin map from Rogue Squadron 2. Oh for goodness sake, who's parked that TIE fighter in a tree? You make your way through the map, blowing up a few ATSTs, taking out a few snipers, and fighting your way into the temple. Hold on, is that Wedge? Boy, he's seen some sh**. You then hop into an X-Wing and fly right into the debris, navigating through this big chunk of the Death Star core which is still intact. The next level takes place during the Battle of Hoth and starts with X2 leading a group of rebels as they defend Echo Base. Okay, let's ride the Tauntaun. Right, I guess they hadn't programmed the Tauntauns yet. I guess I can just push it along the battlefield instead, or have the Tauntaun ride me instead like these guys. This is an updated version of the original game's map. It's bigger and more detailed. But of course, it wouldn't be a Hoth mission without getting into a speeder and blowing up some walkers. You can shoot the tow cable from the gunner seat, but in this early developer build, it kind of looks like confetti. After fighting the Empire on the main battlefield, X2 retreats to the bag hangar to provide support for the rebel transport. Don't worry guys, I'm here to escort you. Ah, oh, Jesus Christ, look it's already up in the air and it's moving like a bee for some reason. The mission ends with X2 going up into the atmosphere, boarding a Star Destroyer and sabotaging its core. The final level of Act 2 is set during the Battle of Endor. We start by freeing some Ewok hostages from the Stormtroopers, then we've got to follow one of the Ewoks as he shows us a safe route through the forest. Just like the original game's map, this one is also set in the forest with the Ewok village in the center and the bunker at the back. Apparently there was supposed 
supposed to be a cutscene where X2 witnesses Han running out of the bunker just before it explodes. This time around, the map also includes this shuttle landing pad with the walker, and this speeder route around the side of the forest which leads to a clearing with some hidden starfighters. And I think this section here is the most impressive part of the game. You jump into an X-Wing and fly up, slowly realizing that the Death Star 2 takes up the entire sky. And you can actually fly inside it. This is incredible, why in the world did they cancel this game? So X2 lands inside, clears out the hangar, and then makes his way deeper inside the Death Star to help Shara obtain the Imperial data files. Come on darling, you can do it, it's a steep step, but I believe in you. And look, at a certain point they must have taken a wrong turn because they end up in the Emperor's throne room taking on the Royal Guards. Guys, come on, go home, didn't you see Vader throw the old man down the shaft? Eventually X2 and Shara get the data, run back to the hangar where they hop into a TIE fighter and bail. The rebels celebrate their victory, but this is far from the end of X2 story because the campaign has one final act which picks up a few years later. X2, who's been trained as a Jedi by Luke, is on the hunt for X1, who's been completely consumed by the dark side and leads an Imperial remnant. The first mission has X2 arrive on Bespin to help Lando take out some Imperials who have taken over Cloud City. Oh, look at poor Lando, he's looking a bit dehydrated. The developers really wanted to show off the size of the map, so they had you start on a small gas platform and then fly to Cloud City. Now, the ground map itself isn't very big, but it's got a few nice locations from the movie, like the carbon freezing chamber, the junk room, and the corridors. The main story objective in this mission is to rescue Lobot, but its real purpose is to show off X2's new Jedi powers. Now, this developer build is missing many of the moves and powers, but judging by Elite Squadron, X2 was going to have all of your standard moves, like Force Push, Saber Throw, and Deflect. This level was also supposed to end with a battle against the Dark Troopers from the Dark Forces game. The next level starts at an old Imperial shipyard, and in a sequence reminiscent of Rogue Squadron, you fly deep into the bowels of a Star Destroyer and blow up its reactor core. You then land on the surface of the planet Dathomir. This map is based around the Imperial facility, which is also surrounded by caves. X2 defeats the Rancor and helps the Rebels break into the facility, where they learn that X1 has been trying to clone the native Sith Witches. And the level ends with X2 having to fight the Night Sister clones. X2, Luke, and the Rebels then track X1 down to his hidden base on Mustafar. In order to get past the planetary defenses, they hijack, sabotage, and crash land a Star Destroyer onto the planet's surface. X2 infiltrates the base, but ends up falling into a trap set by X1, who takes Luke prisoner and escapes. Unfortunately, most of this level is not playable in the developer build, and Elite Squadron reworked the story to make Mustafar the final level in the game. But the map is still playable in both games, and both versions are centered around the downed Star Destroyer. The last campaign level is set on Kashyyyk and it seems to have received the least amount of development. It's not actually playable in the campaign mode, but you can access a very early buggy version of the map through instant action. The map is based around this giant tree and has you navigate between the platforms on the branches, kind of like the PlayStation 2 version of The Force Unleashed. In the campaign, the final mission was supposed to have X2 and the Rebels rescue Luke before X1 could use him as a template for his new clone army. The battle would have X2 take on these Wookiee and Stormtrooper mutants clones before facing his brother in a one-on-one -on -one duel. With X-1 and his forces defeated, X-2 is elevated to the rank of Jedi Master and everyone lives happily ever after. And so that's it for the campaign, but of course this being a Battlefront game there are plenty of other game modes. Just like in the original games, all of the maps are playable in instant action conquest mode, this time across the entire vertical battlefield. There is a new assault mode which has you complete different objectives to push back the opposing faction. Galactic Conquest also returns and this time it would have split the mode into different narrative scenarios. A new challenge mode would have had you complete short minigame-esque missions, but very few of those were actually implemented in the developer build. The hunt mode returns, allowing for Tatooine turf wars between Jawas and Tuscans, the Ewoks quest to get revenge against the Stormtroopers, and a new addition, Ugnaughts electrocuting Stormtroopers on Cloud City while making strange noises. Uh, uh, oh. Plus, there were also supposed to be hunt modes for both Gungans and Wookiees. And finally, we have the fan favorite heroes versus villains mode, where you could duke it out with all your favorite characters across a few select maps. The character roster had been updated for Battlefront 3. The heroes include Mace Windu, Faroda, Sky Trooper, Leia, Chewie, Han, Lando, Kota, Anakin, Luke, Tarful, 
Yoda, Young and old Obi-Wan, Padme, Aayla Sakura and X2. The villains included Dooku, Vader, Zam Wessel, Jango and Bulba, Maul, Palpatine, Droidicus, Grievous, a Knight Sister, IG-88, Dirge from the Clone Wars animated series, Asajj Ventress and X1. That's quite a comprehensive roster, plus it was great to have characters from beyond the movies like Dirge and Kota. Although I'm not sure why they made Zam's rifle so damn long. That and Yoda must have grabbed Qui-Gon's saber by accident. And speaking of which, the soldier classes in Battlefront 3 remained mostly the same apart from the special class which has now been renamed to Melee class. The clones have a lance trooper which seems to have been inspired by the animated series. The droids have a magna guard. The rebels have a Wookiee general with this big club. And the Imperials have a royal guard. Take that you rebel scum. And of course it wouldn't be a Battlefront game without some multiplayer. Obviously there's no Xbox Live but split screen did work for all the maps in instant action. I had an old friend come over to try, the same friend who spent hours playing Galactic Conquest split screen on Battlefront 2 with me back in the day. And even in this buggy, jittery, unfinished version of the game, it was still great fun. I'm landing, I'm landing. Yes, okay, get in. Mace Windu, master of the Jedi squad. Yeah, I don't think they quite got the rolling down for the droid because it's more of a bounce. You can run, but you can't hide from the orbital cannon, Mace Windu. And so there we have it, Star Wars Battlefront 3. And as much as I loved finally getting to play through this developer build, it was quite a bittersweet experience. Because even in this unfinished state, it's clear this game was going to be something special. Free Radical's ambition and love for the source material is evident in every single level of this game. Not not only did it attempt to do something really exciting and truly new with its vertical battlefield system, but it also had an epic campaign that, while a bit out there, did ride by both the prequels and the original trilogy, while also integrating the expanded universe. All of which would have made Battlefront 3 one of the best Star Wars games ever. Thankfully, the community has been keeping Battlefront 3 alive by continually patching the leaked version into a more playable state. There is also Battlefront 3 Legacy, a large-scale mod of the second game which tries to get as close as possible to Battlefront 3 and it looks pretty amazing. So let me know if you'd like to see a video about it in the future. In the meantime, please let me know your thoughts on Battlefront 3 in the comments below. What did you think of the campaign, the vertical battlefield, and which map would have been your favourite? As always, thanks for watching. Please consider supporting me on Patreon and a big thanks to all my existing patrons. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and hit the bell. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.